Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome uh, to tonight's uh, lecture. Uh, for those people that are joining us from the outside, I am Felipe Correa. I am the chair of the Department of Architecture. And I'm very, very happy to uh, have uh, uh, Professor Nazreen Saraji as our lecturer today. Uh, this uh, uh, lecture is sponsored by the Department of Architecture in conjunction with the third semester architecture course studio uh, taught by professors Monel Kafif, Ali Fard, Esther Lawrence, and Matthew Joel, uh, which focuses on housing. Uh, and uh, of course, the connections between the work uh, of uh, Atalier Siraji and housing are very, very sort of direct. And I think that that'll be uh, an incredible uh, a part of the lecture. Uh, moving on, uh, I'm, uh, it is an absolute honor for me to introduce architect and professor Nazreen Saraji to the UVA School of Architecture this evening. Born in Tehran and educated in London, shortly after graduating from the Architectural Association, Saraji moved to Paris and established Atelier Saraji. The office gained international recognition very early on after Nazreen won the international competition for the temporary building for the American Center in Paris in 1991, a project that by all accounts superseded and overshadowed the permanent building that came to replace it years later. Since then, Saraji and her team have developed an impressive body of work, one in which the architect plays a crucial role in being a critical mediator between society and space. Projects from the temporary American Center to the Musée de la Caverne du Dragon to the Lille School of Architecture Extension show a thoughtful and nuanced approach to institution building through design. Similarly, Saraji's commitment to the design and implementation of housing projects demonstrates architecture's unique ability to construct not just residential spaces, but also, a more, expansive, but also more expansive notions of what constitutes the domestic within the urban. Conceived as critical essays in architectural form, Saraji's buildings are simultaneously a mirror and an agent of change in the context where they are cited. Intertwined with Nazreen's professional practice is her academic trajectory. Saraji has held full-time and visiting professorships in Europe, North America, and Asia. Saraji served as architecture director at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, chair of the architecture department at Cornell University, dean of the Ecole Nationale Superior de Architecture, uh, Paris Malaquais, and most recently head of the architecture department at the University of Hong Kong, where she is currently a professor. An extremely generous educator, Nazreen has inspired and guided younger generations with the same passion and commitment with which she guided her own practice. I know I have personally learned a lot from you, Nasreen, uh, and perhaps my favorite quote is when you said, a younger generation must publish in order not to perish. I, for one, took that one very seriously. Nasreen, we are absolutely delighted to have you here tonight. Welcome to UVA. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Felipe. It, um, it is such a joy to see you in one of my favorite universities, the favorite university in America where I have never visited. Thank you, Mona, for having um, sort of thought of me after all these years. And thank you, Isla, for again, not having seen me for all these years, but having uh, remembered and made this possible for me to be looking through this frame uh, and sharing my ideas with, um, that younger generation that Felipe was just talking about, which I believe is um, really the hope of um, our discipline, the hope of our discipline, because as all of you know, um, it is in not in danger, but in a very, very um, <coughs> sort of sensitive place right now. Um, let me see if I can get this to work. As you all know, um, and have seen my um, the, the the sort of the the topic of my lecture um, is from architecture urbanism to integrative architecture, and through this I'm going to uh, be sharing with you the sort of 
this huge story, this epic story of um, a project that we did over 10 years in, uh, in Paris. As you know, uh, architecture is extremely, um, is extremely slow and uh, it, um, it creates a life of itself and pulls us through it. Uh, it's probably very, very basic to say that we live in contradictory, unstable, unpredictable and polluted times. But then <clears throat> we could um, constantly self um, sort of uh, uh, patulate ourselves and uh, think, th think that there is no um, possibility of going anywhere else in the situation that we are both uh, in a post-climate world, in a globalized world, in something that you are all, at least all American friends, are, are experiencing uh, in direct uh, television these days. But then uh, we need to, as architects, constantly not only think about the silver lining, but think about the way that we can actually change uh, these uh, polluted times. It probably took this much to think about democracy or this much to think about police violence or this much to love architecture again. I mean, do we have to actually lose something in order to be in the media 24 hours a day? Or this within the most incredible place of symbolic modern architecture to think about equity and equality in our societies again. Or this to think about the environment again, perhaps when the <clears throat> Sydney Opera House perhaps disappears in this fantastic sort of smoke screen that was the cause that was caused almost a year and a half ago in the in, with the bushfires in Australia. And this to think about globalization. Now, all of these have a very very specific. Uh, effect on architecture. Architecture is all about, of course, it's Vienna. I had to put Vienna in, you know. It's all about ideas. It's about ideas that are looking forward, but also are perhaps not in the right time and in the right place of acceptation until they become fashionable, until they become something that one can really. Uh, react to or one can identify with. Maybe we have to all as architects bring architecture to be as powerful as LVMH and Louis Vuitton. Now, in my birth country, Iran, I'm considered as half. Hence the cover of this monograph that I designed as my full picture was not allowed to appear on, on, the, on the magazine, which is the sort of the, the Iranian version, if you like, of, <clears throat> of um, El Khotis. Now, uh, the, the sort of the image of a woman <clears throat> is not considered, it cannot be shown as full. Uh, so as a designer, as an architect, as somebody who thinks of all of these constraints in my life as something which has to be turned into an opportunity, I took the, this opportunity to actually draw the other half of my, uh, it's exactly the photograph, but drawn in lines. Now a drawing in the Islamic world has a very different um, sort of um, implication as the image itself. And therefore that passed. So I think that um, what I'm trying to say with this is that we are always uh, trying as, uh, as architects to, to go beyond the constraint that we are facing. Now in the West though, where I was educated, my salary is 25% less than that of a male professor, in architecture at least. In Asia, if I order a beer, I get the tea that a male friend has ordered. So I designed my new British passport after the Brexit to be the United Republic of Architecture with the nine muses of the arts. 
And take away from Virginia Woolf, what I have always thought as the liberating moment for all women. Therefore, as a woman, I have no country. As a woman, my country is the world of architecture and therefore I don't need any visas to go anywhere. I didn't decide to study architecture when I was five years old. I came to it very, very late. Very late after having entered medical school, I studied medicine in Isfahan, a city in Iran <clears throat> that is now registered as a world heritage site. Never has architecture been so dissolved yet present in another city. Isfahan is an integrative city, what I call integrative architecture. If you can bear with me to understand the, this hypothesis that I'm putting forward in my lecture tonight. And uh, as you know, Isfahan being a 17th century uh, city, it could also be called an ecological urbanism. Now, um, arriving in architecture school at the AA was a shock, but it was also a liberation at the same time. I was discovering the ideas of rationality, order, and division. In one word, modernism, and the idea of hyperfunctionalism leading to its destruction through people like Jane Jacobs and the new urbanists, leaving all of us to think about what cities can be in the 21st century. The beginning and end of my uh, practice as a solo architect uh, started in 1991, as Felipe mentioned, with this tiny little building, uh, which was barely 900 square meters, exactly to talk about it, 906 square meters, that's 9,000, no, sorry, uh, yeah, 9,600 square feet in 1991. Now, um, you can also uh, sort of calculate uh, buildings, not only in square meters, but also in cubic uh, meters. And today we can even calculate it in cubic uh, meters and kilowatts per hour of their energy consumption. But it was sort of an urban sonography or um, it, was, uh, it created this possibility for me to be interested in urban sonography or how architecture creates a theater of programs, actions, life, and a possible sense of astonishment, which we call in French étonnement, or what everyone probably calls today serendipity, that, that surprise that is not written in the work. I was um, very lucky to be able to build as, uh, uh, at a such young age, because I think at that time I was probably 31 uh, when I won this competition. My first clients were the famous board of directors uh, of the American Center in Paris with a history uh, dating back to Josephine Baker and many American artists in residence in Paris since 1936. Only American art lovers uh, would have accepted a temporary building made entirely of cheap materials claiming to be a stage set. Uh, this was supposed to be for their life and for their life of being on the site before the arrival of uh, their big brother building by Frank Gehry, who was being selected at the time that I was uh, building this building to design the permanent American Center. Now, after the removal of the American Center building, I realized that there was something uh, extremely exciting about the city and that the city was an incredibly robust theater for architecture and started to investigate how an architect could work with urbanism <laughs> and landscape, of course, uh, in projects that could engage the political, the economic or the economical and the social in the city and how one could make an architecture that is integrative and not plastic. Let's go back for a minute to this old grandfather of, uh, of uh, modernism. Uh, the iconic European figure, Le Corbusier, <clears throat> he reminds us 
or reminds our, most of us of the origins of our thinking and why we cannot think like the way that the moderns did anymore. Now, um, after his seminal works on the contemporary city for 3 million inhabitants in 1922, Le Corbusier, the great grandfather of modernism, com compacted all the basic urban essentials into an autonomous singular object. His 1947 Unité d'habitation in, uh, uh, I mean, he compacted it in the Unité d'habitation. In 1966, Aldo Rossi brought attention to the city and its evolution through time and to the necessity to continue the history of its sedimented layers and complex relationships. Just a few years um, later, Charles Jenks announced the official death of modernism with the well-known demolition images of Yamazaki's Pruitt Igo <coughs> housing project in San Luis, which I'm sure that all of you who are probably, uh, who are in this studio have already studied and all of you probably know very well anyway. Rem Kohlhaas was deep in his thoughts at the time, writing his masterpiece, The Leaders of New York, constructing the foundations of this um, everlasting engagement with the city via the super programmed skyscraper. Through Big Heavy Beautiful, the latest project that we uh, did in my studio or the last project in Paris, and the project which is basically the subject of tonight's lecture, uh, which we won in 2007 and completed in 2017, uh, I shall demonstrate how this triple inheritance of the modern culture of architecture has shaped my practice and thinking since my formative years at the AA. The use of drawing as a critical tool and the architecturalization of the urban have been key to the design of this complex project, an attempt to create a new type of urban assemblage in the specific condition of the city of Paris. Now, <clears throat> Uh, Le Corbusier, uh, compact, when he compacted everything into one big heavy uh, rectangular block, he called it the Unité d'Habitation and, and it, reform, it, it reformed or even deformed the way that we uh, even now think about the city. The beauty of the model is its density, compactness, and the promise of greenery and no vis-a-vis -vis horizontal and uh, not vertical. Its section is crucial and much more important than its plans. Though he had cl uh, uh, climbed that, uh, claimed that the uh, plan is the generator. Every apartment has two facades. One is facing the sea, the other facing the mountains. One is orientated toward the east uh, therefore breakfast in the sun, and the other toward the west, therefore dinner in the sunset. One could probably call this very basic joys of life. Le Corbusier idealized the city as a dialogue, dichotomy, contradiction between open space and tall buildings, solid and void, buildings and landscapes. He packed and ordered things in mega boxes, and in between left the lush green voids. He was an idealist with immense belief in human intelligence. Now, <clears throat> this man who all of you know, Aldo Rossi came, he believed in the city, the city as a sedimented artifact that was never totalized. He redirected us to look at Piranesi again and learn from it after the modern theories of the city, he anchored architecture to the city and claimed that architecture is the city. Shortly after, uh, Charles Jenks brought us to perhaps believe that modern architecture was dead. But I wonder, and I wondered at the time, whether he wasn't just uh, trying to clear the path for what was to come for all of us and his theory of postmodernism. Because really, can we believe when we see uh, the work of Rem Kolhas that modernism is dead? Or was it taking another form and was it being drawn up in a different way? 
Ren much later said, much later, if you watch the, this, um, this film called The Other Architect, you can hear him say that he was interested in the section where the other modern, he never, uh, he never utters the word uh, Le Corbusier or even any of his references. Uh, he sometimes talks about Mies, but very sort of despairingly. Uh, but he talked about uh, the way that, he talks about the way that the other modern had left to um, the section to new exploration, explorations. Uh, I think that he meant that if, Le Corbu uh, if Corbusier said that the plan is the generator, then he would like to stipulate uh, in this uh, saying that he says that they give, gave attention to section, uh, that it is the section that generates opportunities to come. And, that gener and we see that very evidently in the way that he brings the section to be the act that to play the active role of um, the sort of the superimposed programming in uh, the Lears, New York. Now, where do I or my generation stand in all of this? Uh, what kind of city, what kind of living and what kind of architecture? In 2007, in France, we popped a, many, not just one, but many bottles of champagne. Uh, we won the competition in 2007, and the project was inaugurated in 2017. These 10 years were probably the most intense years of my practice and teaching. I had been nominated as the director or dean of a very young school of architecture, which was only in living for five years, in the venerable site of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, where architectural education had started in the 17th century. I had just inaugurated the largest European exhibition on collective housing and at that time won the most prestigious competition uh, for a mega project in Paris. We never won a major competition until then, until we discovered that the project can only be approximations of our best ambitions for the program, economics and the social mix of the public using the building. Competitions have become a way of choosing the project with the most potential for change and amendments. Architects need to seriously think about this. You know, you remember the famous Le Corbusier avertissement or uh, attention to architects. Well, I'm not trying to sort of uh, to, to, to echo that, but in a way I'm trying to ask myself the question of what do we think of a project which promises the most change? So we were chosen as three architects uh, on a Parisian plot. And uh, this meant that we had to deal with a many uh, a complex sort of uh, situation of a clientele. In fact, projects always become extremely, not just difficult, but extremely complex when the architect has to dance between um, and it brings us back to so this fantastic figure of the dancing architect with the Doric column on his head in the 17th century uh, as this sort of this, not any longer the synthesizer, but it's this person that needs to speak many languages. And therefore, these many languages, is not they're not only drawings and the way that we think, but it's also many languages in terms of the way that we try to convince uh, each different shareholder or stakeholder as they are called in the development world of, um, of architecture. So the main client you can see here in terms of almost in terms of the scale, the main client was RATP, which is basically the, um, <clears throat> the sort of the uh, public Paris transport um, of the, 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 the sort of the region of Paris, but also the extra muros uh, Paris uh, from uh, of the regional transport. But then there were sort of uh, developers of um, social housing, uh, private developers, but also a sort of a, uh, not a project management, but somebody who deals with the projects of these developers, the project uh, developers of the, uh, of the public transport uh, development uh, company for, the, for uh, public housing for their own uh, employees, uh, and also Logitransport, uh, which is uh, 
this developer, but also um, a, a, a Paris as Paris Paris Habitat, which is basically the developer for the city of Paris for social housing. Now, the site is an interesting site because it's very, very rare to find, uh, you know, uh, almost it's almost 2.7 um, 2.3 hectares but 1.76 hectares for the uh, for the parcel or for the site which was given to this uh, to this project but the sites are extremely um, rare in Paris and to have a site of this uh, this sort of scale which basically is one huge block in Paris uh, is extremely a rarity and therefore extremely complex uh, the, the slide on, uh, on my right is basically, or on your left rather, uh, is <clears throat> the one that shows the sort of the basic urban planning that was given onto, the, onto this housing by some other architects, which later on became the architects of one of the, one of the uh, buildings on the site. Now, the beauty of Paris also is this sort of this um, uh, diagrammatic way that one sees it on one side, which is the River Seine, uh, which we turned into the logo with the logo of the, of the Paris Transport um, uh, Authority, but also this sort of this absolute um, density of both uh, over or above ground, but also the underground of Paris. Now, uh, the question of mobility and Smart cities is not a new sort of one in, in Paris, perhaps. Uh, the city has always been a place uh, of production and uh, uh, the, the services uh, now and again make full circle back to this production. Eugène Enard uh, was somebody that uh, uh, interested me in terms of the section of the city to bring in to the understanding of this project and appropriation of the complexity of the site, uh, which was basically saying that this is going to be the future or the rue future or the future city in the 19th century, uh, which was going to be the 20th century uh, future cities of, of Paris. Everything that is the production is going to be under and everything that is going to be another kind of production is going to be over. But you can even see here how the production goes all the way up perhaps to maybe to the third or fourth floor. Uh, another thing that is important for all of you to, 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 to see is the, is the sort of the extent of the site. Now, of course, we put the Charles de Gaulle uh, uh, aircraft carrier, but you can see the, the sort of uh, both the height uh, possibility of the site, uh, not, of course, the crown of the aircraft carrier, but the aircraft carrier in terms of uh, its body, but also the way that it uh, sort of diagonally could probably uh, come and land uh, onto our site. It also is important for all of us to have a culture of the understanding of um, the density through both its sort of horizontality, but also in terms of its compactness. So this is, of course, taken from uh, a very sort of famous drawing of Korb when he's trying to sort of um, legitimize the, the density of the unité d'habitation. But we took every uh, single apartment, we put them apart based on the regulations of land and parcelization to see how much land we would need as opposed to the uh, four to seven floors of um, uh, the section of our building. Now, the site in 2007 was uh, something which is uh, quite interesting in terms of its occupation. It is all occupied by, um, by uh, various uh, sort of warehouses that the buses are already uh, using both as maintenance, but as also as depot. Uh, the proposition in 2007 still leaves uh, when we were uh, when we won the competition we had to leave as one of the constraints the sort of the the the, uh, the warehouses and work within the sort of the site uh, uh, conserving the warehouses as they were and therefore have what is called the sort of chest of drawer um, operation which actually allows the existence and the operation of the site to continue parallel with the building which was going to be making our lives hell. Uh, now the, 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 what I call uh, reason pragmatism is the way that one looks at 
uh, the the way that one can uh, work not only with the sort of with the extension of the capacity of the volume, but how this volumetric, if one can even call it a volumetric urban chunk or piece can begin to connect itself to other places, but also create an interiority for, its, for itself that becomes that interiority that every housing uh, project of this scale uh, needs, to, uh, needs to have and needs to sustain. So for, to give you a sort of a little um, uh, uh, area, a sort of um, uh, understanding of this, 17,000 square meters of housing, you multiply that by, uh, by almost three meters, uh, you get the volume of the housing that one needs. Uh, kindergarten for 66 beds, daycare center for 33 uh, children to come in and go out every day, shops, uh, sort of what is called a senior club where basically uh, older aged uh, pensioners could come and uh, use the club for, for a day. 170 parking spaces, and of course, 15,000 square meters of bus maintenance uh, area. Uh, these don't really need any uh, explanation. Uh, it basically shows what I think about the plan. Uh, post uh, Le Corbusier plan is the generator. I think the plan is organizational, and the plan is very diagrammatic. These are the plans that we won the competition with. These are the sections that we won the competition with. The, uh, I do think that the section is very much of an intentional, uh, uh, architecturally intentional um, sort of spatial um, uh, drawing, which also uh, demonstrates uh, the reality of the way that the, that the building should work. So, I don't really think that the three-dimensional is the only uh, way that one can work with a project, but the section already demonstrates that in an abstract way, of course. The facade is probably the promise of something to come. And the model is the experimentation of all the arenas that one can um, <clears throat> work with and to see how uh, one can actually come up with, um, with not only a variety of possibilities, but also uh, the realities of these possibilities on our uh, place. Then, as Felipe mentioned as well, yes, I do believe that uh, you have to publish or perish. Now, publishing in uh, the reality of a project that you're constructing is a very different thing. Of course, there is the reframing of the work that is quite important, but also we made it our business for every single stage of the project to have at least um, to record all of the books, the dossiers, the proof of um, the archiving of the project from day one onwards. And well, the planning permission is completely different and it has nothing to do with that archiving, but you can see that the architect one way or another is very much um, in, in, in responsible for creating the publication in order for that to become the fact and the fact of the matter itself. Now, in summer 2008, we thought that we had won the whole thing. We had um, submitted the planning permission. We were on the way. We had the financing. Everything was going. We were very happy. We were saying, at last, one project that is not going to ruin us financially. And therefore, we're going to take a little bit of a deserved holiday after a year and a half of working extremely hard in the office with about 20 people with me, uh, which uh, were convinced that this project was going to be an incredibly uh, um, important project in the life of the in the life of the studio. But then um, the RATP or the uh, public transport uh, decided to change the type of buses that they were going to have, and they were going to be automated buses. They're going to be articulated buses, and they're going to be much bigger they're going to be and they're going to be uh, controlled through machinery and computer programs and uh, the logistics of the whole of this um, uh, project was going to change and therefore back to square one in uh, the way that we were uh, going to work with the project so the buses had to change places from being over and the parking being under, the buses had to come under and the parking over, which completely changed the total structuring of the building in itself. Therefore, what do you do? You begin to draw everything again, but you also in this position 
that you fall into, which you actually are gaining some more time, you begin to see how can we, through the structure, completely minimize the structure uh, in its thinnest form, in its most not only efficient form, but also in its most architecturally efficient minimum and thin form. It all of a sudden gives you a fantastic belly of the of the of Moby Dick. It actually gives you a fantastic uh, thoracic sort of structure that begins to be very specific, both under and over. Uh, when I talked to a very uh, very um, dear landscape architect that unfortunately now has passed away, uh, told me that he would love to work on this project, even though it is an artificial garden that is going to happen on top of the roof because of the fact that it has to deal with uh, sort of such a complex structure over and above the bus uh, center. So the project was uh, to be re um, programmed, resized, re-volumed, re-everything. Re um, it was going to be um, taking more of the space that it had taken because also the RATP had decided that it was very futile to in fact deal with the project as something which was going to be uh, being uh, constructed at the same time that uh, the bus uh, center was functioning. And therefore, uh, we found a most fantastic sort of possibility for our courtyard to be much, much bigger and therefore much more uh, effective in terms of the way that it would bring the community uh, into, the, into the project. Here's the site as it was in 2008. And this is what happened by taking out those um, uh, sort of early 20th century, um, very, very thin um, uh, sort of um, uh, bus depot out and pushing the building out in order to have also uh, a wider sort of courtyard in the middle of it. Uh, I think it's extremely important to, to name projects. It's, um, uh, I, if, you, if anybody has the time to go on my website, you'll see that every project has a very specific name to it. We decided to baptize this one Big, Heavy, Beautiful uh, because of the fact that uh, it was describing the main ideals, but also the idea of the project in terms of its, uh, its uh, immensity, but also uh, the fact that one could work with that immensity in a very elegant and very uh, specific way and manner. When we uh, when we had to stop the project and sort of um, and sort of think about the reprogramming of it and uh, the sort of rescaling of it and uh, restructuring of it, we started to look also at different ways of describing the project through the uh, through the drawings. I think these are all fantastic opportunities for all of us to begin not only to uh, to to see what our building is about, but also to experiment with the way that it actually unfolds itself in uh, the way that one promenades around the building. We will never see a building's facades in one way, but for that person that goes to their house every day and every day of the year, then there are certain uh, possibilities of um, juxtapositioning of these complexities that happen that could be very uh, important for all of us to at least to begin to sort of think about. Or even this diagram, which was um, immediately giving us the possibility of seeing how complex the arrival to our, um, to our building would be uh, once we uh, begin to think about the section and the platform from which uh, all, the, all, the, all the housing uh, units need to be accessed. In that same time, uh, we took this opportunity to publish the, the, the intentions of the project, which, will, which I knew very much that were not necessarily going to be its reality. The project as we had uh, uh, worked on it as the composition, the project as we had uh, begun to sort of uh, rethink and the project that was going to be constructed. They were not going to be the same thing. And I thought that it's ex extremely important to, to sort of to record the different lives of the, of the project right from the start. So uh, we went for um, 
uh, sort of asking the client to help us to finance a book, which was basically going to be um, bringing the project and its intentions in the <clears throat> in the public eye. And this uh, project depicts uh, sort of a very, very specific moment of, um, uh, of the building. When, for instance, the building was, uh, we had designed the buildings uh, sort of uh, inner skin or inner courtyard skin to be of um, these huge tiles of about seven, ceramic tiles of about 70 uh, centimeters by 160 centimeters, which um, 70 in the, in the sort of in the uh, width and 160 the length of it to um, to show that the internal sort of um, stomach, if you like, or the lining of the courtyard needed to be much, much lighter than the, than the, than the external uh, facades of the building. So <clears throat> at that point, uh, we were getting to the uh, pro to the moment of the project going full speed ahead after having uh, sort of submitted the second uh, the second sort of um, uh, tender documents to the contractors uh, for this new project. Now, um, you can see through this sort of the density of this floor of all of the, the base floor of our project, the density of the buses that needed to be uh, found uh, on the base. And you can see how we completely almost cover the totality of the, of the, of the site. Here's the uh, section, uh, which is a sort of a, tongue-in-cheek section to um, toward the section of um, uh, Korb uh, when he was designing the Pavillon Suisse or the Swiss Pavilion uh, nearby, uh, only about five minutes walk from our building site, uh, which actually describes the volatility and the sort of the softness of uh, the ground of this part of Paris, because it's uh, it's the uh, it's the part of Paris which has been excavated, of course, for it's the plaster of Paris in the nine in the late 18th and 19th century, completely and early 20th century. And so every time that you are working with this part of Paris, you either have to solidify, consolidate the ground that you're working with, or and you have to uh, take your piles extremely deep down. So this is also somehow in our mind, or at least in my mind, when we're drawing this uh, section uh, and also coordinating it as we were the coordinating, uh, coordinating architect on the side to also take the uh, project of our friends on the side and bring it into the project in order to be able to uh, show the totality of the site and its relationship to its surrounding. Pavillon Suisse. So you can see here now the details of the plans of the crèche or the nursery, which happens to be in this L shape here and the sort of the imbrication that it has in plan at one level with the sort of overlooking the car park area of the, uh, of the building. And then here, once you arrive up from the ground level, onto the uh, onto um, uh, sort of this main staircase one side you go into the nursery the day the um, the daycare center at the bottom and the nursery which is basically the crash that you come in all day and you are here every day you come back every day as a child whereas here there are different children that can be coming into the into the nursery uh, on different days so you can see here the sort of the main section at the level of the buses, at the level of the, um, of the car park, at the level of the crèche and the nursery, and at the top level of the housing, and the imbrication of the different sort of um, uh, the different uh, levels that bring us to uh, show you this uh, complexity of this volumetric chunk of, of the city of Paris that uh, sort of superimposes on itself. Now, one of the things that is very difficult to understand in uh, France, in Hong Kong, it's a very simple thing. Uh, in Asia, in Singapore, it's a very simple thing. The, the, the sort of the superimposition of parcel of the different parcels belonging to different developers happen just, you know, like um, like clear water, it's a very difficult thing in Europe to do because parcelization happens in plan and not in section. 
So um, here again, this is another section that you see the sort of the, the side on the side, you see the crash, how it comes sitting on top of the buses. That's one of the ways that uh, we found a way of taking, giving the RATP 13 more buses in order to be able to share this lab, which immediately would bump up the sort of the price of our, uh, of our <clears throat> uh, crash. Therefore, we had a much better uh, dollar to the square meter uh, for constructing this because of the fact that these 13 buses were going to bring in a lot of revenue in terms of the in terms of the their their sort of their their storage in the city of Paris as opposed to going out of Paris and then coming back to Paris to serve every bus is equal to something like about 300,000 euros per year which is about a, a little bit more than uh, maybe a uh, uh, $400,000. And so um, it was quite a sort of a, quite a uh, um, sort of a discovery for the, uh, for the RATP to actually accept to go under the ground of the city of Paris. So you have to see that these two parts, that the parcel underground actually doesn't belong to the uh, to the public transport uh, authority. It actually belongs to the city of Paris. And therefore this sort of superimposition of ownership was quite important to be able to be gained in order for us to be able to jack up the, uh, the sort of the, the crèche to be closer to the sun as opposed to being sort of dug down at this at this level and therefore uh, in the lingo of uh, developers which I don't really like very much it's basically called the win-win situation um, now here's also another section that I like very much because it shows the sort of the, uh, the both imbrication but also the superimposition of the different programs and the relationship that they have with the boulevard outside and this is the uh, is a very I think very beautiful section that we have which comes basically uh, uh, which comes basically from the boulevard through uh, the main entrance takes you into the into the two levels of parking uh, if you have a bike you can bike all the way up to this level where you have your uh, sort of um, bicycle storage and then you go up to your um, to your uh, flats. Now uh, you can now measure the sort of the uh, the why we were so uh, interested in helping the sort of um, go over the uh, the entire site, but also to create this interiority for the for the courtyard and actually create this uh, sort of not only just a public space, but a a, a commune communal space, which actually would allow both functionally for the for the. <clears throat> Uh, for the fire brigade to be able to come up and uh, and save in the case of fire any of these apartments, but also to have the possibility of um, having a common space for all of the apartments, which are which happen to be two hundred and thirteen now. Uh, you can also see that I mean this was an earlier drawing where we were trying to see how. Um, the A320 Airbus would fit in there and how then later on with the larger uh, sort of courtyard, how the dome of the Pantheon would fit in there. And here's the sort of the finality of the drawing with, um, with that level of the plan, which basically shows you the openness that the plan has in these sort of sections and how this uh, these apartment buildings that are private apartment buildings sit on the side with a sort of a dividing garden between the two. But also we have, we have tried to keep the sort of the, not to contain the building completely, but at least at the ground and uh, first floor level to create the sort of openness and therefore um, <clears throat> de-enclave, if you like, the sort of, and open the, 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 the plan in itself. Uh, the project as we go up then of course closes and it becomes a complete sort of um, what I call the snail going on top of itself and it starts from the fourth, uh, fourth um, four floors and it goes up as we go around the snails uh, sort of uh, uh, closing on itself to the maximum height that we can go at this level which is seven floors above the <clears throat> 
the grade level that we have. Here, this is a drawing which basically shows you the sort of the internal, um, uh, by now you know that the facade has completely changed. It's no longer what I showed you in the book. It is something that has completely changed to become uh, a very, very different sort of um, uh, combination of lodges, terraces, and windows in the internal uh, sort of side. We've still kept the difference of material um, uh, within the inside of the courtyard to the outside. You will see that later on. But you can also see this unfolded um, internal facade, which shows basically the way that uh, the sort of the, the, the piercing of this envelope happens and how much uh, we have given uh, uh, priority to every apartment having both um, uh, sort of its internal spaces, but also an ex what I call an external room of itself. The, um, the, 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 the roof um, it was quite important. I was telling you about it before, how we wanted the roof to become this uh, sort of usable landscape. We worked with um, uh, plants that would allow um, one another's destruction, but also one another's, uh, one another's um, uh, maintenance in order for it to be a very, very sort of self-sustaining uh, uh, um, uh, carpet on the roof, but also a place that people could actually garden in and use the garden as an associate within, with the help of an association to actually uh, have their vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. You'll see it later on. So the construction started uh, finally uh, three years before, uh, so in 2000 and uh, late 2013, early 2014, uh, in fact, <clears throat> and it took exactly three years for the construction to, to be finished. So as I often say, and I have always said it in both uh, to my students, but also to uh, my architect friends, is that we always start, um, uh, architect, we always start this fantastic um, sort of uh, thing of construction with demolition. You know, we turn thinness uh, uh, into thickness, especially in the architecture of today. So if we can keep, if we destruct thinness and but then try with that thinness to uh, create another thinness, I think we have achieved quite a lot. So you can see this, I'm going to go through this quite quickly. I'm not going to describe any of these, but you can see the sort of the, the com combination of the, um, the work both on the drawing board, how clean and meticulous it can be and how messy uh, it can get, uh, even though I'm quite proud of these fantastic columns that are beautifully, um, we fought for them very much, but they're the very, very good um, uh, concrete, which you usually can only get with very large budgets, such as airport budgets and not in housing. But in order to have um, both in the, in something which is so devalued, such as a garage, such a uh, bus uh, uh, terminus, to have such fantastic concrete is uh, quite uh, rare. Or to, uh, to insist uh, as an architect to actually be very articulate in terms of the entrance of even a bus depot. A bus depot is not just an underground, but it is somewhere that all of uh, a, a huge number of people are actually working day and night. And how through its architecture, through the rounding of the corners, not to have the, uh, not to have the sort of the rectangular um, uh, columns that actually block the views to begin to create this sort of spatiality of not, I don't want to call it softness, but uh, sort of a larger views, both diagonally and, uh, and uh, sort of um, uh, straightforwardness within the within the um, uh, in the uh, uh, underground um, uh, garage uh, places. Now um, you can see also that the this project is a combination of poured in concrete in situ, but also uh, but also prefab uh, uh, panels that come and have to be uh, sort of hoisted. These are 16 meter high uh, panels that would come and then they would be hoisted up on the uh, on, on site uh, in order to create a fantastic, for me, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit 
uh, it's a little bit difficult to work uh, to use these words after Trump's uh, use of abuse of the word fantastic, great, and whatever. But I think that uh, it uh, shows how um, theatrical also the entrance, the simple entrance from the boulevard to the uh, parking, but also the the usual bikers a sort of um, uh, route from the uh, outside, from the street, from the boulevard can be toward the, uh, toward the private apartment they, they go to. To just show you the sort of the sizes of things that happen in this and um, sort of the underbelly, which then becomes the, the place where the buses go for maintenance. And how then uh, through this uh, large courtyard we actually had, uh, which is basically uh, almost 42 meters by 40, 40, 40 and a half meters uh, to, uh, to be able to actually work uh, very clearly and very uh, efficiently from the inside, both as the outside. And so um, the sort of the various details that allow for, the, uh, for this sort of a uh, surface garden to happen, but also the way that you begin to um, uh, bring all of the ventilation of the, um, of the um, bus depot out between buildings and not uh, into the garden itself. So um, the, the, the project carries on, as you see, from the very, very thin uh, sort of skins, uh, slowly, slowly it thickens up. The regulations being also nowadays that uh, you need to completely um, uh, sort of wrap all of your buildings in the thickest mink coats that you have, which I think is a complete aberration. And we really, the younger generation really needs to look at this and completely um, challenge this because it's not by putting all of this uh, toxic, uh, horrible material that one can actually um, uh, insulate the buildings better than they were before, but we need to fight for that. And that fight is going to be something which is going to carry on at least in this uh, sort of um, uh, third decade of the 21st century. Um, so as you can see, uh, the project goes on, it's beginning to be built, it's beginning to take shape. And uh, we have to be, we were absolutely uh, present on this. I had three architects, three major sort of chief architects working, one on the crèche or the nursery, one working on the bus depot and one working with the housing. So when the project becomes so complex, uh, it is not only the BIM uh, sort of program that uh, saves you, but it's also the human sort of factor which ne needs to come to this complexity because the architect having drawn so much of the drawings knows exactly every detail that needs to be uh, worked in a very, very specific way. So yes, concrete is the most criminal invention that we have had, even though it created a, a fantastic sort of possibility for the domino house, but it has also created the most incredibly polluting material that we have uh, in uh, our disposition and the easiest way for the contractors to actually build buildings. But we can still make it to be something we have to make it to be something which is not as grim and as um, impossible as it is, as it is, both aesthetically, but also in terms of its capacity that it brings to um, the large, <clears throat> uh, the large spans that we can work with. The spans of the buses are quite important as they go from the section two uh, up, because the buses need, we cannot have uh, more than 15 meter, 15 by 15 meter uh, column grid, whereas for housing, that is an impossible column grid that one can have. So all of these transfers, as opposed to just the transfer load and the transfer um, um, uh, sort of slab, one needs to really work with in terms of the way that you create two different structures that can be superimposed in such a way that you can actually uh, work, with, um, work, uh, work with these uh, contradictions, if you like, of the superimposing programs that you have. Now, now, you can see here the sort of the vastness of these columns. You can see them also, as I showed here, at least in terms of the buses, but also the person standing next to them, uh, the sort of the scale of the place. This is um, under the under the beam, there has to be a seven meter uh, clear, um, uh, sort of clear, um, 
six meter fifty actually clear um, uh, height for the buses. You can see the scale of the ventilation uh, that goes from the sort of from this bus depot, uh, which starts from the ground level and finally toward the end of the site becomes two levels below the uh, below ground. So um, we use also the sort of the, the slope of the, the slope of the site in order to move up to the maintenance area. But we also have to, of course, you see these different colors. They're not just different colors because of the fact that I like going from pink to red, but it's because of the fact that you have to uh, create three different uh, uh, sections uh, for the uh, for the bus depot in order to be able to completely fire uh, proof them from one another and therefore they become uh, three different sections that are closed. These are very very large <coughs> uh, sliding uh, sliding doors that close compl completely one compartment from the other in case of fire. The social housing is the sort of the, the crowning of all of this. Here is now, now you, we begin to see the finished job. You saw the sort of the ugliness of the concrete, the wetness of the concrete, the, the sort of the, the severity and the bigness of the concrete. Now we are getting to the beauty of the concrete and also the way that it becomes uh, another way of um, dealing with the material. Now, now um, the materials are very, very few in this building. It's basically corrugated metal and corrugated concrete and smooth concrete that you see. Uh, you also see this, so this is a sort of an opening onto the ramp um, that you just saw from the from where you uh, from where you can park your bikes uh, you can see that we insisted on even designing the bike um, the bike stands uh, in order to have the complete not control but the complete capacity of being able to uh, to sort of match the the the, uh, the building's um, components to one another uh, <clears throat> The sort of uh, the the views from, for instance, the bicycle sheds toward the uh, toward the outside. Always uh, being very extra careful how one works with sort of the base as opposed to the top. Yes, of course, it's a 19th century uh, idea. At the same time, I think that it is something that uh, the human scale needs to always be um, always be looked at in a very different way in the building. So. Um, the building's uh, internal sort of, if you like, gut uh, area or the stomach or what, you know, it's this is a, this is also something that uh, is not only its references are are not only the references that one has with <clears throat> the moderns Le Corbusier or even Ram Colhas, but it it is I think our one's culture of understanding of the culture of architecture is quite important, uh, even though. Uh, a lot of architects don't like to sort of divulge their uh, their references, but uh, uh, you know, it's I think it's important to see how you can bring to um, sort of to to light some of these uh, some of these sort of um, uh, con lines of continuity with architecture as um, as uh, they uh, they are uh, put together. So Gaudi has been somebody that I have. Uh, being very interested in, in terms of the way that he deals with material, and therefore the sort of the skinning of the inside of the of the uh, of the courtyard becomes quite important for me. So you can see these um, sort of um, the different um, uh, uh, sort of the beginnings of some of these uh, moments. Uh, here's the uh, the third floor um, uh, bus. Um, on top of the bus depot and the, on top of the uh, the crash and the nursery here we have on the third floor we have the sort of the uh, the area for the bikes so um, there was an intention of all of these to be filled with more apartments but then uh, when you have 300 square meters of bikes it's probably best to actually bring them into the light as opposed to uh, leaving them somewhere in the basement that nobody would want to uh, uh, take and they would bring their bikes anyway higher up and uh, so the way that one begins to negotiate with the client and begin to bring the client to understand the possibilities of some of these spaces as those spaces that actually count in um, in a very large uh, housing scheme is quite important. 
the relationship that the building has with the outside, therefore, uh, is has been completely primordial in all of the work that I have done. The way that every apartment can have an external space, which actually um, <clears throat> becomes this sort of um, this mediating uh, space between the city and the apartments are quite important. How you deal with that, how you give some comfort, uh, even through the handrails, those places that you have the promiscuity of the neighboring uh, uh, densities that you have in uh, places like in Paris and those places that you actually allow the sort of openness and the, and the transparency to happen in the city. So even the way that one begins to design the sort of the closure and the enclosure, but also the transparency and the translucency in these balconies uh, begin to, uh, to matter as, uh, as you see. Or, even in the apartments, the sort of the, the longer views create a very, very uh, uh, fantastic sense of, um, of um, uh, sort of larger um, uh, or more generous spaces of the uh, very small uh, apartment buildings that one has uh, to deal with in uh, social housing. Uh, this is again one of those sort of openings that I was talking about between the buildings in order to allow for the sort of the, the, the large scale, the big scale and the heavy scale of the, of the building to be, uh, to be both sculpted but cut but also sort of um, operated on in order for it to, to, to create a sort of a, a, a much smaller um, uh, uh, relationship that one can bring into the into the city. So um, <clears throat> these are the uh, sort of the internal um, views of the private apartments. The only difference between them are really the sort of the finishes. So the private apartments have parquet flooring, as you can see, uh, whereas the social housing does only have, have uh, linoleum flooring, but in terms of the windows, the doors, the quality of the openings, the quality of the openings between the kitchen and the, or therefore the spaces that the architect actually controls, there is no difference in my mind and in the way that we have actually designed, but also in the way that we constructed these buildings between the social or the private housing. So the duplexes that are in the, in the social housing actually are, um, they have private terraces, balconies uh, this is a very uh, five of these are very special ones because they sort of they are completely uh, transversal so you have both the sort of the south and uh, the north but also in these two in these cases in these five cases you also have uh, three other balconies on the west and the east side of the apartments uh, you can see the, the the sort of the price of something like this which would be uh, which none of us could probably afford to have one because of the fact that we all earn too much money. And now, um, even though it is 25, in my case, 25% less than my male um, uh, teaching uh, colleagues. Uh, the, um, each uh, floor has a very, very specific reference to itself. We took upon ourselves also the design, the interior of the, uh, of the uh, of the corridors where we could bring in light, we would bring in light where we couldn't, we would create a ceiling which would give the capacity of the lighting to be something which, uh, which works with it almost as natural light. So natural or artificial in my mind are really, I mean, I'm a sort of, it goes back to, <clears throat> Uh, to a James Terrell sort of idea of light. Light is light. However, it all depends on how you deal with it, whether it is artificial or it is, um, or it is um, uh, uh, natural. So uh, for instance, here we can see that it would almost be, you could almost uh, create the same uh, possibility with natural light or in these cases. Now, um, as I said, the balconies, uh, the, uh, the, the sort of the internal courtyard has huge, huge balconies. They are, um, they are um, divided into uh, this sort of main courtyard. Our, let's say our Pantheon courtyard is called the sort of uh, Place de la République or the Republic uh, uh, Piazza. Uh, which basically brings uh, a lot of the metropolitan centers. So I have 
uh, Peking uh, or Beijing, uh, Tokyo. Uh, I have Mexico City, I have Cairo. So each uh, entrance uh, is uh, uh, depicted by one of the most, uh, Sao Paulo is one of them. Um, they are depicted by the most uh, sort of um, uh, dense metropolises that we have, but it also creates a very, very sort of um, uh, uh, appropriated um, uh, sort of sense of belonging to each of these. Uh, finally, the sort of the garden worked as a place which basically all the associations have uh, appropriated. Uh, it is not the garden is a uh, is something which is uh, for everybody that lives in the building. It is not something that you have you can buy your own piece. Uh, of course, uh, you can. Um, it is up to you how you deal with the. Uh, with your own piece. Uh, this, the, the children um, are, uh, they love to be there in term, in the summer when they are actually working on some. There are some school children that come that learn about nature in the city. Uh, you can see that uh, there are fantastic crop. I mean, I haven't, uh, I haven't got any pictures that would show you all the fantastic tomatoes that you would have on there, but uh, the garden is working brilliantly and you as you can see it's just sitting right behind the crash even though the, the the sort of the nursery doesn't allow cannot allow the children to come in there because of the legislation that they should not be touching any kind of plants that may in any way uh, may uh, endanger their health um, this is a sort of a view from the from the neighbors onto the in uh, onto the kindergarten and the sort of the, the 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 nursery and their playroom inside their arrival as i showed in the plan you are here you are coming up to um uh, from the lower level to the top floor uh, of the <coughs> of the uh, uh, the crash and not the uh, and not the uh, um, not the daycare center, which is behind. So the crash brings you, the, the yellow part is basically where all the kitchen and all the food is being prepared. And uh, this is a corridor for the children. As you can see on one side, you have the sort of the, the, the larger, the, <clears throat> the workers and the employees uh, sort of lockers. And you have the children lockers on the other side. Uh, which they appropriate themselves, putting their names on them. Uh, the sort of the waiting uh, space for the for the director uh, of the of the crash. Uh, the um, the sort of the the attention with which one takes into even spaces that are the spaces are of. Um, uh, as I always say to my students, there is no space that is just doesn't uh, deserve our attention. And even the bathrooms and even the toilets deserve a very, very specific attention that architects can bring into it. Uh, this is the sort of the, <clears throat> the enfilade that you can find with the children's um, um, playrooms versus the places that they sleep. So you can see the heights are where the, 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 the children, the height of the wall goes higher and lower where the children are playing not to not to sort of uh, uh, not to bother and uh, and uh, the, 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 the kids that are sleeping in the other rooms but also from a level onwards everything is glazed in order to bring in uh, completely the light at the level of the uh, this is what I call the swimming pool room uh, it's a tiny tiny bath place where they can only have 25 centimeters of water in order for them not to drown at the same time the way that I tiled the whole place it was in order to allow for the children to understand the, uh, the, the sort of the depth of the uh, of the pool itself uh, the outside this was sort of um, this is a place where all the now all these plants had to be studied so that if the children ate them, they wouldn't be poisoned with them. So these are all the complexities that one brings into uh, the joys of architecture. Um, <clears throat> and you can see 
both one side, which is completely uh, their playground, which is this is the this is the nursery and and this is the daycare center, and which actually uh, their play uh, area is like a loggia that is completely open to the boulevard, but uh, it is covered and uh, they can be there both at the time where it's raining, but it is completely open so they can have air and uh, it would actually be a fantastic, uh, what one calls a COVID space today. But um, uh, the, the, in the evening when the, uh, especially in the winter, um, the kids are there until about five, five thirty, and so it was important to be able to always give them the sort of this notion of um, the, the 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 relationship that they have between the inside uh, and the outside. So um, also a play on the way that they would um, uh, they would be looking at the ceiling of their playground, but also that play to be repeated with the tiling system that we have brought into the ceramic system that we have brought into the sort of surface of their, um, of their outside play um, area. Now the press <clears throat> is probably not interested in architecture nor architects at all. Uh, architecture I think is uh, politics. It's politicians need architecture, architects need politicians. Housing used to be the best way to be reelected. But it's not any longer. Now it's you museums. And I still believe that housing needs to be uh, the, the largest and the most important equipment or the equipment or the public uh, of the publicness of the buildings that we have. Uh, of course, uh, when housings of this scale go up, the mayors are the ones that are the ones that are in the uh, limelight. And that's fantastic for all of us, but it's the director of the construction in 2017, the director of construction in 2007, you can see that things change. The deputy mayor of Paris it was in charge of the urbanism all this time. The president CEO of the, of the RATP, the mayor of Paris, myself and the mayor of the district. However, uh, what is uh, very interesting to see is that as we are working for 10 years, there are lots of things that are ha happening in the world. Um, <laughs> France changed three presidents. America changed three presidents in the time that we were working on this project. We um, worked on 42 projects at the time that we were working on, with this, uh, on this specific construction. There were 35 architects that were in my office uh, in the duration of this time. There are 10 years of negotiations that happened. And uh, climate change came to an impossibility. We went through disasters. Uh, China's pollution, uh, mainland China's pollution has, is now history almost. Uh, it's um, sort of its power uh, of the capital power is now marching on. Now, these are the things that we worked on in these 10 years. There were projects of different sizes, of different scales, mainly housing, as you can see. But then working with China was something that was also teaching us extreme um, situations. Working with uh, huge projects, territorial projects, even in France, working with uh, the sort of the church of, um, of Orthodox church in Paris as a competition. So this is the way that the, the sort of the trans uh, sort of section of um, uh, or transversal section of the life of the architect happens once you are actually stuck on a project. And uh, as I always like to say, uh, it is most of our imagination comes from these realities that we're working with. Now I haven't, the project is finished, but I think as I said to you earlier on, the project has many lives. The post-occupancy is now the other project that I'm working with. I'm working with um, on a book called Appropriations, the way that the project has been appropriated by a lot of people. So I have invited a sociologist, a photographer, an anthropologist, and um, somebody who will be drawing with me the, these different lives. So we drew as the drawings were propositional. They were speculative when they were <clears throat> when they were being, when we were competing. They became propositional when we started to build this building. And now they are going, going to be a reality that people are living. So um, through um, uh, the work of uh, a very good uh, artist, photographer, 
and a sociologist that is actually interviewing all the 213 uh, apartment uh, inhabitants. And we are going to be redrawing the project the way that is now lived in. Architecture is the art of doing, doing more with what we have, more quality, more meaning, more pleasure for a very long time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Nasreen. Uh, that was a phenomenal lecture. It was uh, uh, absolutely fascinating to be able to see uh, uh, one project uh, from beginning to end. And uh, uh, I'm sure the audience has uh, uh, a great amount of questions. So maybe we can uh, uh, open directly to the audience and then uh, I'll come back uh, uh, with, a, with a sort of a, a couple of questions uh, or comments, but we should let the audience uh, uh, speak first. So uh, just feel free. Uh, to uh, either raise your hand and uh, uh, unmute yourself uh, and speak, or you can also put a question in the chat, but uh, uh, it would be nicer if, uh, 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 if you just sort of take them on the microphone. Not everybody at the same time, please. Who's doing first? So, Okay, while, while they're thinking, uh, while they're thinking, maybe I'll start with, uh, uh, a, a, with a, a, a first sort of comment slash question, it, which for me has to do with the difference between, uh, or, or, or the relationship between sort of the project as an urban project versus the project as an architectural project. Uh, and one thing that's fascinating about the project is that in its first iterations, you define the larger morphologies without defining the specificities of its part. Uh -huh. And then it's over time that sort of the original framework allows for that specificity to evolve. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about sort of a, the, the level of resolution that the project uh -huh. went through different phases. It's a very good question because um, it actually, it's something that I have only been able to um, think about post sort of design in a way. But um, we know that it's not something that you only think about because you, if it comes across, if it's something that allows you to think about it, you've been conscious of it all along. But I think that, um, as I said, right at the beginning, um, we really wanted to win this competition. It was a competition that, um, that uh, it was quite important, not in terms of uh, it's one and a half percent uh, fees that it was going to give us or 10% fees that it was going to give us, but as a competition, because after all these years, I wanted to um, uh, directly see what the, um, uh, what capacities we had in order to build in a city as complicated and complex as Paris, not only in terms of the complexity of the clients, but also the, the sort of the different forces to come that come to one another. I had, I had met that in a very, very sort of restrained way uh, with the project of the American Center, but the fact that the city of Paris has more than 50 concessionary uh, sort of um, uh, committees that have to deal with every single part of the building was quite important. So um, when we were working on the competition, I was more worried about the sort of the way that we could uh, attract those people that were going to be um, giving us the project. And that was sort of the, the overall volumetrics of this thing. I mean, you, you saw the project is very different from the moment that it was in a competition when it went into d design development, when we changed it, and then when it became the, the project itself. So this sort of, this idea of how one would work with the urban at that level, how one would work with, the, with something which was, um, symbolically extremely important for RATP or for, uh, for, for, for the public transport to have a sort of their, their mightiness to be the symbol on this street in this specific place, right where 
there is the sort of the Cité Internationale starts and behind that you have the Parc Montsouris, you have a park. How this articulation would happen was, uh, would become extremely important at that level of the competition. And then slowly, slowly you go through uh, the facts of housing and how you need to negotiate yourself, but also with a lot of these complexities. So things begin to fall into place. Sometimes they're big. Sometimes you have to cut them up. Sometimes you have to tell them apart. Sometimes you have to put them aside. Sometimes you have to threaten. Uh, and sometimes, and so the project begins to take shape. So I don't know if I'm really answering your question, Felipe, but I think that it's um, the process of moving from something which is, uh, which is the possibility of the project to something which becomes the reality of the project is very much the complexity that I think we see in this, uh, in this, um, in this scheme. Now we can talk about it more. You can, you can tell me more and we can sort of, I don't wanna make this a, sort of a monologue. So I've already talked about the project. So Mona, I see Mona, so you can, you can bring in your sort of addition to that. Yeah, I have another, I don't know, it's a question, comment. Um, Ali and I were sharing a little bit in between saying, oh my God, that's so amazing because our students were exactly dealing with these questions today. You know, the way how you design, um, for example, the daycare situation, how you negotiate, as Felipe said, between the city and the architecture, but then also think it as a place that is going to be a home for people you do not know at the moment. Mm. Our students are struggling with, at the, or had been struggling over the term of the semester and will continue doing this until final review, I guess, is A, the design of affordability. How can design be a strong factor in designing affordable housing? So how can this be a question of design? Then how are we designing a home for somebody we don't know? And how are we facilitating space for a community? Because we are dealing in huge parts with affordable housing. And the big question is how can the larger urban block be not only the home for individual people living in units, but can foster the idea of having communal life or commonly shared spaces. And I find mm -hmm. it extremely beautiful that you have a second part of your project the project that was designed through your imagination and the 50 people probably who had been a part onto your design team and all the, you know, the engineers who had been a part of it. But then now that it's built, it's taken over by people who are living there and your interest in understanding what your infrastructure is facilitating as a place for a home or for life and community. I find this super beautiful that there is the second chapter and that you take this as serious as you took the design serious. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering while you were designing it, do you have mm -hmm. any advice for our students to address how to design a home for people you don't know, how to design a place for a community you don't know and how to design affordability in general? Because I remember a couple of times when you said, and then we had to shift this and this was a huge part in the budget. So yeah. our students don't have a budget, you know, it's all yeah. fiction basically, but of they course. Can, yeah obviously also foster affordability through design. Well, the, the, that's why I put that slide with the, with the song of John Lennon. You know, reality is probably the most incredible thing that gives us imagination. Now, what is that reality? The one, uh, we don't have, I mean, even the, the problem with social housing is that we don't even know, I mean, as, as an architect, when I'm, when I'm designing this project that the competition um, at the competition um, stage, we don't even know the client. We don't even know what they want. I mean, it's, it's closed competition until we go into the moment of being winning the competition, then we start talking to them. So we don't know that. When we get into the housing, we don't know what kind of people are going to be living there. Sometimes it's the client that tells us, oh, well, that's not gonna work because these people don't want this or that. I always say to myself um, that we cannot be the lawyers of the clients that we don't know. And the client cannot be the lawyers of the clients that they don't. But there are certain things that we have in our societies. There's inequality. 
There are mothers that are alone and they have to run, uh, shop stuff, bring it in. Um, uh, the kid is running, uh, they have their... So we need to just look at the society extremely, extremely um, uh, precisely. The precision with which we are interested in others and the precision with which we look will give us the clues of where we can. So when somebody in my office draws the kitchen way out of the way, and I have to go through the door, then go through something, then go to the kitchen, I go, what happens when I'm coming up and my bottle of wine is broken and I'm going to take that all over the place? So the kitchen immediately has to be very close to the entrance door. But then what happens with the lights? So how do we, so I think that I do something which is which people always think that I'm mad, but when I'm designing, I always talk to myself. I always talk to the plan, I always talk to the people. Now, I think that interest that we have for others' lives, that interest that we have in within the society that we're in, will give, uh, give us the right clues in terms of how to design. Now, it's not going to be universal, but in a in housing, what we do have as a possibility is to create a variety. One of the things that I didn't talk about in this is that you saw it maybe in that color thing, but there are there are 32 different types of apartments that we have in the 213 apartments that we have. So when the economist says that they have to all be the same, I, I challenge that. I challenge that in terms of all the same doesn't mean anything unless you actually bring to me the possibility of the economy that you're going to have in that. So I would say, okay, I'm going to work with three materials in my building. That's economy. Because if I work with three materials, it's all the same thing. But then how am I going to allow variety for, those, uh, material, for that material to happen, okay? If I have the same corrugated metal, then I will bring three different uh, waves into it. One of them is a large wave, which is 16 centimeters apart. The other one's eight, the other one's, it's the same material. It's the same uh, place that we're, they're going, the contractor is going to order it. It's the same company, however, the detail of that changes. So as soon as you put the three materials to one another, you, you create a composition of that material, which is very different. This is a lesson from, this is a lesson from Jorn Utzon and the Sydney Opera House, that you take the same material, but then depending on whether you have it as white, as white matte, as white glossy, as white white, then all of a sudden you have five materials that come together. So I think that also goes in terms of the way that we look at society. You have, yes, we have the same single mothers. You have the same married families. You have the nucleus family. However, that's the typologies. And then within those typologies, we have very specific ways that we all like to live. Who doesn't want to have a place whereby they can have their dinner outside between six in the evening. Okay, there are people in the building that are now completely because of their, uh, of, their, of their religion, because of the fact that they don't want to be seen by other people, that they have completely covered their balconies with, uh, with, um, uh, with a cloth. So I'm not the, con I, have, I have a very, very easy sort of, once my building is delivered, built, given to its inhabitants, it's theirs. They can do whatever they want to do with it. It's not going to take anything away from the architecture of it, even though I think that sometimes it becomes a sore eye in something. So I think that it's very much to do with, look, observe our society very closely. See where you have difficulties with it and where you think architecture can come in. It doesn't have to be, we're not sociologists. We cannot work as sociologists. We are not going to be social engineering anything. At the same time, the basic joy of life for everybody is almost the same. Now, some people can have more of it. Some people can have it gilded in gold. Some people just a simple life of being able to get your breakfast when it's sunny, being able to have your dinner, being able to... Uh, 
as I say in the office, turn a cat in your apartment because it has diagonals and it has width and it has breadth, being able to come into your door and not be, have a wall in front of you because the more you actually create the possibility of perspective in a small space, the more space you're creating, even if it is a fake idea of space, but it opens you up. The fact that uh, you can have cross ventilation because of the fact that you know these are a small part. So I think that basics are very small. Those are the basics that then you begin to add onto it. And that's exactly what I think Felipe was saying as well, at the scale of the urban, when all of my apartments begin to have the possibility of one or two orientations, it immediately changes your perspective of when you are inside your apartment. So I think that, and those are the places that these very, uh, varieties happen. Now, in terms of designing affordability, now, again, it comes back to, I think it comes back to very much common sense. Common sense with as an absolute appetite for, um, for wanting to do better. Mm -hmm. This sort of this ambition, the ambition that one has that that better is not only for me, but that better is for someone else creates all sorts of different ways that one can think about affordability. So affordability, one part of it relies on those three different presidents that were elected in the time of the thing. Some of them depends on the mayor of Paris and the mayor of the area. Some of it depends on um, the, the sort of the regulations that each policy brings into place. And some of it relies on us. Once we begin to think of affordability in terms of, uh, in terms of let's, let's take very simple materials, you know, uh, the, the, when the, when the client tells you we cannot afford to give any kind of um, parquet flooring to the, to the social housing, you don't just say, well, okay, fine, I'm not gonna do it or fine. Uh, you begin to find, okay, within the range that you have, what are the things that you can take out and take in in order to create that? Now, that's where you have the budget. When you have the budget and I go, okay, do I wanna put all of this in this or do I wanna put all of this in this? But with the students, the, the design of the affordability is something which is very abstract. So it is something that um, in housing today, we know very much that whatever you do, um, piping and insulation and all of that costs a lot of money. So is it important for us to have every single apartment to have one single kitchen? Isn't it fantastic for us to begin to um, propose different ways of living in this new time and age. And I'm not talking about COVID. I'm not talking about uh, viruses. We're gonna have so many of these coming our way anyway with the change of the permafrost and what's happening to our, uh, to our world. But we can think of saying that, okay, maybe it's not a bad idea to have seven kitchens of seven apartments that would want to have a very large kitchen that they all share. So there are, design possibilities that one can bring, especially when we are working with abstractions. And those are the ways that we can begin to change the mode of thinking when we are in school. Because once you're confronted with the client, he's gonna say, I want every apartment to have a kitchen, every apartment to have a terrace. Yeah, they say, okay, every terrace has to have a maximum of five square meters. If I can make that five square meters to be something which is 10, well, I'll make it. But that all depends on geometry, on the way that you look at, um, that you look at plans and the way that you look at uh, sections, on the way that where can you share what with. And I think that's, the, that's really the complexity, but also the beauty of architecture. Mm -hmm. So you can design affordability and you can design. Uh, when you don't know someone, because there are so many people that are in front of us. Observe them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nasreen. Maybe, maybe now we can sort of uh, uh, take one or two questions. It's getting late, sure. but we can take one or two questions from the audience. 
Uh, I have a question. And uh, before I start, I just want to uh, say how much I appreciate this uh, uh, presentation because it really is, I'm, I'm in the studio that Mona's talking about, about affordable housing. And it, this one really helps me think very differently about the problems that we're facing. Um, but you uh, alluded to a point of um, how users are going to start to use the buildings once you're complete, once they're complete, once they're built and everything. Um, you know, you have the project done and then you hand it off and then it's theirs. They're just going to use it. Um, and to that, I want to ask, so for example, there is in, in the nursery, there is that place kind of a, a small terrace of sorts that is covered um, in a kind of a thick slab so that the kids can be outside to use the space, even if it's raining, et cetera. Um, and that's could probably be used in several different ways. Uh, but is there in any of the projects, maybe this project, maybe, maybe end of the project that you've uh, designed before, mm -hmm. Is there one where you handed it off and then you observed how the users use it and then you were kind of sur su surprised by the way that they appropriated the space, uh, given that you've designed it for a very specific use? Or do you approach it in a way that you design this space to be flexible or do you expect people to use it differently? Good question. Um, there are certain certain spaces that you um, you add without anybody asking you in the program. You know, for instance, nobody asks us to have a sort of a uh, a covered uh, play space for the kids. Uh, in the section of the project, some places you grab that and say, "Okay, I'm going to give this to the kids because uh, what am I going to do? I'm not going to block it off and close it." I'll open it up, no facade here, open to the trees in the summer. The trees are covering it in the winter. There are no trees, and this can be a place where they can play. It's within the program of the crash, so nobody else can do anything with it anyway. Now, if they don't want to use it, they don't use it. If they don't want to send the kids out, they don't do it. That's their, uh, that's their decision. However, going back into your uh, question, uh, the, the extension of your question, yes, sometimes you do uh, design things for a specific uh, uh, function. I don't, I tend not to design spaces that are only allowing for one thing to happen, you know. But let's say that you design a staircase that you sort of at the bottom of it, at the uh, in front of it, or whatever you try to put. Yes, in other projects, I have a corridor where it's outside, half outside, half inside. And uh, in front of each entrance door, uh, we have designed these um, in order to do a sort of a, a structural um, uh, consolidation, we've created these concrete uh, benches. Now, um, the client was very much against them. They said that uh, we can't, you know, uh, because I was, I, was, I was begging for covering some of the concrete with some wooden panels so that people could sit on them. But, uh, the client didn't want to do it. Okay, fine, let's not do it because of economy or whatever. People have started to turn them into shoe boxes before they enter their apartments. So they've created sort of shelving systems with them. So that's, there are certain things that you make and you want to make it better in order for it to become something else. And you're not allowed to, that's in the reality of the construction. You guys, you can, you always, as, as students and as projects with, when I'm working with my students, I go, go to the end. When it doesn't, don't worry about how people use it. People are intelligent. That's why I was insisting on what Corp believed in as an intelligence of people. People are intelligent. They can use their st stuff the way they want to. Now, am I going to be worried about some people completely blocking off their, uh, their, um, their terraces, which is about 12 square meters of external space because, because they don't want their, the, because, you know, maybe the, the husband doesn't want his wife to be seen by others in the courtyard. 
that's not really for me to worry about. Yes, it does create a sort of a weird um, uh, picture in the courtyard, which is supposed to be all open. But at the end of the day, that's the both the difficulty, but also the fantastic uh, sort of um, opportunity about housing is that you have to have a relationship with the project, which is very tenuous. It, it, it goes. You spend 10 years of your life and you have to give it. It's not yours. It is not yours. I mean, architecture is not ours. Architecture is something that relies on our generosity to be given. So we do our best in it. But then when it goes, what are we going to do about it? Now, in some cases, you can say, okay, if we have an education for our kids to be in a space that is in a crash space or in a nursery, whereby every day that they go, they have a fantastic relationship with their space. Maybe that will work on their collective memory as it goes on. But that's all we can hope for. We can't hope for, hope for more. We cannot in any way as architects force our, um, our sort of our supremacy, if you like. So I'm not worried if they use it differently. Clients may be worried about it because they're the ones that actually try to manage the building that after us. I sometimes actually make the building in order for the people to say, hey, wait a minute, there's something here where therefore we can use it differently. I give you another example and then I stop here. And that was the client didn't want us to open up. You know, we had, because of the shape of the building, there were these areas that we had on the roof, which were actually terraces and balconies that we could open up for two apartments to use it. And the client was saying, they're gonna leave their beer bottles, it's gonna to have to be managed, there's not gonna be cleaned, whatever. And I said, okay, here's what we do. We create a double door for it. We open it up. If you see that it doesn't work, lock it up with the second door and nobody goes in there. We did, nothing has happened. People are using it, they're barbecuing on it, they're cleaning it. They're so. I think that there are certain things that you can work with like that, but in your design, don't have any, when you're, when you're designing in school, don't, have, don't stop yourself, go to the end and allow human intelligence to deal with it. Very good. Thank well, you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nasreen. I think this was a phenomenal evening for us. Uh, hopefully equally a good uh, morning for you. It's very early, so we also appreciate it. Uh, but I didn't mention this in the introduction, but Nazreen is in Hong Kong. So uh, uh, it has been, a, it is a very early rise for uh, Nazreen today. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, and we look forward to having you uh, again, ideally in person uh, sometime soon. Uh, and we'll have a celebratory uh, dinner, uh, sort of, uh, uh, which we should have had after this lecture if you would have been here in person. So uh, thank you.